Now, in this video, we're going to be talking about the basal ganglia and the cerebellum. So, so far, we've gone over the basic overarching organization of how motor information is passed from the brain, where the instructions are formed, to then form a sequence of actions, to then the specific actions need to be carried out by the muscles. So this information is sent from the neocortex through one of two cortical spinal tracts, to interneurons, to motor neurons, which then connects with uh, flexor or extensor muscles. In addition to the importance of the neocortex, we have the basal ganglia and the cerebellum, and they're very, very important in movement control. What we've just reviewed and gone over with regards to how motor information travels from the motor cortex down to the muscles is a sensory motor hierarchy. So the basal ganglia and the cerebellum, they interact with different levels of this sensory motor hierarchy. What they primarily do is they coordinate and they modulate. So the cerebellum would be involved in coordinating and the basal ganglia would be involved in modulating. They also permit the maintenance of visually guided responses despite cortical damage. So even if you have some damage to motor areas, then you can still engage in visually guided motor movements via the basal ganglia, which is subcortical, and the cerebellum. So the basal ganglia, it receives input from all areas of the neocortex and the limbic cortex, including the motor cortex. Uh, it's also part of the nigrostriatal dopaminergic system from the substantia niagara. The basal ganglia projects back to the motor cortex and the substantia niagara, and it subserves a wide range of functions, including association or habit learning, motivation, emotion, and motor control. So the basal ganglia is basically one of these structures that links uh, evolu very evolutionarily old systems and very evolutionarily new systems. Early on, our behavior was much more simpler in its goal-driven properties. What type of information did we pursue in the environment? What type of information did we interact with? It was primarily with things that were associated with primary reinforcers. And the two primary reinforcers are food and sex. So food, of course, being necessary for the sustaining of our species, a sustaining of ourselves, excuse me, and sex being necessary for the propagation of the species. And so emotion and motivation, they evolved out of those very early primary reinforcers. And the habits that are, of course, hardest for us to break are also the ones that are associated with these primary reinforcers the largest and most important and most problematic at this point being food. People can have very complex relationships with food and form very, very strong associations. So here's the basal ganglia connections. So the basal ganglia is subcortical, so it's in a really great position to receive information from all sorts of cortical areas of the brain. And you can see here, it's receiving information from the frontal lobes, it's receiving information from the parietal, from the occipital, it's receiving information from the brainstem, and it's also sending information to the brainstem, and it's also receiving and sending information to the motor cortex. Here you can see the basal ganglia in purple, how uh, widespread it is. The basal ganglia includes the caudate nucleus, the putamen, and the globus pallidus. So these are all subcortical areas that are in uh, really great positions to be connected with a range of, of cortical areas. So it keeps it very, very centrally involved in behavior. Because of its central invo um, involvement and because it's part of the nigrostriatal dopaminergic system, then it's also, because it taps into also some of these primary reinforcers, then it's also something that tends to uh, aspects of it can be hijacked or affected by drug use and addiction in general. The basal ganglia is most known for the control of movement force. So damage to the basal ganglia can produce two main types of motor symptoms. You can have hyperkinetic symptoms. This is when damage to the caudate putamen causes unwanted writhing and twitching movements called dyskinesia. This is seen in Huntington's and Tourette's. So you can have like tics and um, spasms. And then you have hypokinetic symptoms. 
This is when damage to the basal ganglia results in a loss of motor ability, leading to rigidity and difficulty initiating and producing movement. And this is seen in Parkinson's. So you can have hyperkinetic, which would be excess movement, or you can have hypokinetic, which would be restricted and impaired or a loss of motor movement. Now we move on to the cerebellum. So we talked a little bit about the basal ganglia, and now we're going to be talking about the cerebellum. The cerebellum is really important for improving movement control. So it has two main functions, timing and maintaining movement accuracy. So the timing element, uh, it really closely tracks movements and perceptions, and the maintaining movement accuracy is highly involved in error correction. So what the cerebellum does is it compares the intended movement with the actual movement and makes the necessary adjustments accordingly. One of the things that um, we'll talk a little bit later about in this class is the different types of intelligences. It's becoming more and more accepted that there are different types, that you can, people are, can be intelligent in very, very different ways. One of the ways people can actually be intelligent is in elements of their movement control. So athletes have exceptional movement control, and this is likely due to a very well-developed and connected cerebellum. Uh, I don't know anything about the genetics of, of the cerebellum, and uh, but from what people say with regards to sort of movement giftedness, it's definitely something that you are that you are born with this sort of potential, um, but it's not clear that everybody uses it all the time. And, but if you've, I'm not a huge sports fan, but even, but when I do watch, it is amazing to me the type of awareness that these individuals can have about where their body is in the environment. So it's amazing to me when I watch professional football, for example, because the athletes, they're trying to always make um, the first down. And they have an idea of where that first down is, but it's a pretty much, it's measured in yards, which is a, that's a pretty, you know, that's a pretty big span. And so of course, when we're watching, then they draw lines on the screen that correspond with where the first down is. But the athletes, they oftentimes do not know. And so you can see some with incredible accuracy when they catch a ball and how they are moving with respect to the field. They are very, very mindful of where their body is in this space. That they put their toes just right as they catch a ball to make sure that it counts for being in bounds. And so these types of behaviors are, these types of behaviors highly involve the cerebellum. This timing and maintenance of accuracy so it's highly likely that these professional football players that are particularly good at movement accuracy have, uh, have large and well-connected cerebellums. So just as I began to delve into in the, my prior example, the cerebellum improves movement control by trying to adjust timing and accuracy. So the cortex sends motor instructions to the spinal cord copy of the same instructions is sent to the cerebellum. The sensory receptors code the actual movement and send a message about it back to the cerebellum. The cerebellum therefore has information about both versions of movement, what you intended to do and what you actually did, and then can calculate the error and tell the cortex how to correct the movement. So this would be really, really important for the types of athletic behaviors that I described in the prior example. And not only is it really important for those type of exceptional examples, it's really important for us engaging with our environment, for learning to walk. When we go up and down stairs, we don't often have to think about where the next stair is. This has become something that's automatic. And if we are moving on uneven terrain, uh, so the cerebellum is really good at keeping us on track. If we are moving on uneven terrain, we're going to be jumping over from one rock to another rock. We have the ability to sort of automatically make these connections. When we jump, then we sort of understand how we landed, how far close we were to where we intend to land, and then when we make the next jump on to sort of the next rock, then our body can make this uh, timed uh, and accurate correction based upon the communication 
of both the motor and sensory information to the cerebellum. And here's an example of how this motor communication happens. So here's the information in the cortex, okay? It's being sent down the cortical spinal tracts. And so the copy of instructions gets sent to the spinal cord for movement to be enacted. And then a copy also gets sent to the inferior olives. This sends a copy of the instructions to the cerebellum. The cerebellum also receives information, feedback information from the uh, sensory receptors, the, this spinocerebral tract, and this enters the cerebellum, and then it calculates sort of error and correction information, and this information gets sent back to the cortex. So the next time that you throw the dart, you'll have a much more accurate uh, throw. Although, of course, this will take lots and lots of practice. So the next time you throw the dart, you'll get a little more accurate and then a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more. And so you can have the practice effects that would be needed to engage in fine motor movement control or uh, gross corrections for balance when you're on uneven terrain.